for, for, the, for the changes that we're trying to see. Yeah, and so I thought a lot about this because so when I did, so my first kind of foray into neighborhoods was in Rocky Mount. And I heard that very thing. We, we did like a whole, a whole nine month kind of deep dive into the community in uh, Southeast Rocky Mount. And folks said, you know, everyone talks about integration as being a good thing, but when we integrated, it actually left so many of our teachers and the students who were bright were pushed to the back, right? And so I think about that in segregation, and I often tell people it's not the separation of people that's necessarily in and of itself the bad thing. It's okay if you want to be culturally with the folks you know are relevant with you. It's the investment that happens, and it's the investment that happens even in in black middle class neighborhoods. So there's this book called Black uh, Picket Fences that shows similar levels of disinvestment in neighborhoods that are compositionally not poor necessarily. Um, and so I think it gets down to: Is there a way to invest in neighborhoods without? the kind of displacement that typically happens and how do we value you know kind of homes in those neighborhoods because i know also that the same home in one a white neighborhood is very is valued differently than a black neighborhood so how do we break up that system that says that black is devalued literally you know whether it's well economic you know economically or otherwise and i don't know that i don't know that there's a policy fix for it because that is so entrenched it like racism is like it's the, you know, my dad says it's the original sin. It's in the very fabric of our, our, our country. And so, you know, it really will take a, dis, a, a, a reimagining and a dismantling of that to say, how do we value, you know, black folks and other marginalized racial groups just as much? And how do we create systems um, that construct opportunity for everybody? Because that's really what it's about, right? Like, literally, how do we construct opportunity so that everyone gets to thrive? and that, that some communities aren't pushed to the margin. So do I have the policy fix for that? No, but it's a great question because, you know, because you, you might say, okay, residential segregation matters, so just automatically let's integrate, but that might not necessarily be the solution. So I think we, you def, that's, again, why you have to have a historical perspective on these things. That's why I think, that's one of the reasons I spend so much time there because we tend, you know, as epidemiologists, we say, okay, this factor influences this factor, so let's change this. But if you don't know the history of how we got there, then the changes that we make can actually have kind of unintended, or sometimes maybe even intended consequences. So but that's a great question, and I probably did not answer it. But. No, no, that was a great answer. Yeah. Yes. You talked about kind of Brazil and the kind of black-white dichotomy and one dark rules in the U.S. not necessarily applying there, but. I think you know race still categories are fluid here, and we have a very multicultural society. So yeah. What do you think about kind of how we think about this kind of work in the context of the United States? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's important. And actually, Jamie Slaughter AC has a really cool paper out on colorism and showing differences with like um, I think it's maternal. I can't remember her outcome, but she she really deconstructs. You know colorism in the United States and how it it actually does play out, um, and it's still also very much rooted in that system of racism of how we created color or colorism preference based on skin color. Um, so I think we actually could learn um, from a context like Brazil um, in terms of uh, thinking about uh, a little bit more nuanced about how race is captured in this context and and create studies that kind of get at that a little bit more. Um, so that we can see those kind of um, differences um, in our in our own kind of outcomes here in the United States. And when I think about uh, immigrants from not necessarily part of the African diaspora, although some there, I think a lot of the story of America is kind of people being racialized into whiteness in opposition to blackness. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you think that's still the way it's happening, or if mm -hmm. things have even changed kind of racialization of Muslim populations and um, yeah. some other right. populations. No, I think, I mean, again, it's, so the way I think that white supremacy operates is it keeps this racial hierarchy and it racializes Latino folks. It racializes, so Brazilian folks, some Brazilians who are white in Brazil come to the United States and now they're Latin, <laughs> they're, now they're Latino. And they, and I have Brazilian colleagues who happen to be white and it is such a, it's a, such a shocker to them because they are automatically assumed, like people start speaking to them in Spanish and they're automatically assumed to be, like I have a friend from Argentina, she comes here and she's like, she's a, uh, so she's been, she's being racialized, right? They're being racialized because of the, the racial context of this country. Whereas when they go back to the Brazil or Argentina, they're white, 
right? And so again, this idea that we can that we create these systems, we create these structures where your own racial identity can change depending on where you are in the world and what that means in terms of like these categories that we create on the set. Like, what do they really mean? Because they can actually change. Um, but it really is kind of what what are the social forces that kind of impact you depending on which context, racialized context you're in. So the first question, what I'll say is, um, I was actually drawn to like kind of cardiometabolic because I think it's a nice example of how racism becomes embodied, right? So just this idea, like the, the everyday issues that you have to deal with, whether it's discrimination, whether it's the communities in which you live, you literally, your body literally reacts to it. And you literally see this dysregulation across cardiovascular systems, metabolic systems, et cetera. So I think it's just a really nice example of, sh of demonstrating that. And then in terms of the work with the Jackson Heart Study, I was drawn to it because I'm a daughter of the South. I'm from down South, I'm from, and to be able to study racism in the deep South, in that context, I think it just, it, that juxtaposition was really important. So there, there was the data, right? Cardiovascular disease makes sense because it is literally one of the ways in which things come, become embodied. We see these higher rates of stroke in, you know, in the stroke belt, higher rates of diabetes, obesity, et cetera. But thinking, again, reframing it to think about the ways in which structural racism shapes that, right? And then it becomes embodied. The second question, I do think there needs to be cross kind of conversations across these contexts. And particularly, you know, how do we take policy or maybe even things we're thinking about on the continent to places like the Deep South or to places like Brazil? Like the context, you know, when, I, when I'm in Jackson, Mississippi, and then I go to, you know, Salvador, Bahia, I see the structural inequalities, I kind of see that those contexts are very similar. So we could probably, I do think we could be learning from one another. And one of the things that I hope to do um, really is just really build a transnational network of, of scholars thinking about these issues. So I've, that's one of the reasons I've been connecting with black Brazilian scholars in Brazil, um, because they're having these same conversations, but what if we had them together? And what if we thought about them together and thought about the ways we, again, change the narrative around health inequalities, but also come up with the solutions necessary to mitigate these issues? So it's a, I think it's an important, important question. Well, we're out of time. I want to thank you again, Cheryl, for thank coming you. by. It's good to be home.